thank you for your invitation. I'm talking about to change for knowing. Please find uh, contents today. I selected a different type of research. I propose you uh, four topics, four sections. In the first section, I try to distinguish exactly differences between cutaneous perception and haptic perception. Second topic will concern how does touch function with four point manual exploratory movement, perceptual feel of exploratory movement, free versus restricted manual exploration, and last, differences in visual and, and haptic functioning. In the third section, I will examine intermodal visuoptic coordination. And finally, I will present you two practical applications of research on haptics. First, in education, with multisensorial method dedicated to typically children, and in blindness, we study about tactile picture recognition by blind people. So, research on touch perception is less developed than research on vision or audition, because touch has often been considered in a minor sensory modality, and because it also raises a number of difficulties. However, the interest devoted to touch perception has drastically improved this last decade. Several explanations are possible. First, currently, most researchers consider that understanding visual perception is not enough to understand all other perception. Second, there are a large number of tactile interfaces, very varied and produced by different companies. Of course, advances in the field have important implications for rehabilitation in blindness, but also in a number of other areas, as, for example, first, robotics, second, education, also ergonomy, video games, etc. And last explanation is about uh, advance in neuroscience. The new tools of cerebral imagery, for example, uh, fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imagery, revealed original observation, very original observation, showing our great cerebral plasticity at birth. For example, some studies show that during the execution of tactile tasks, such as braille reading, for example, the primary and secondary cerebral areas are activated, and this recycle activation is higher in congenitally blind people than in later in blindfolded people. Second study, for example, even in blindfolded sighted adults, after a short period, two, or three, or four days of visual deprivation, tactile stimulation activated the occipital visual areas. This means that the visual cortex could change its function and assume a non-visual function when it is early deprived of the light stimulation for which it, it is innately specialized. First section will be uh, examine touch perception. Touch is a contact perception in which it is necessary to distinguish the pure tactile cutaneous perception resulting from the passive stimulation of the skin, called also passive touch, and the active and voluntary exploration executed by a body segment, active, uh, called active touch by Gibson, or also no haptic perception. Tactile cutaneous perception has been studied since the middle of the 19th century by the famous psychophysical works of Weber and Fechner. But touch sensation fade rapidly. They are not associated with movement. More importantly, 
The tactile field is so small that exploratory movements are necessary to access and identify wall objects haptically. In addition, movements provide by themselves information about the nature of the stimulus. David Kast, famous David Cates, was the first psychologist who showed that movement was inherent to touch perception, and his works influenced those proposed by James Gibson some 40 years later. Haptic perception is the main way to obtain tactile knowledge of objects. In haptics, cutaneous, proprioceptive and motor signals are integrated. A complex pattern of stimulation results from this combination, since any movement modifies the state of group of muscle, acts on other groups of muscles. On the other hand, corollary disergies may themselves be used by motor system. All these transformations are difficult to observe and consequently, with precise haptic stimulation, it generally hard to identify. In spite of this complexity, interest for the scientific study of haptic perception begin, began during the 1960s. It, re it resulted from theoretical analysis proposed by Gibson and from the growing social domains of the teacher and professional practitioner working in specialized schools and agencies for blind people. The question where, for example, how does touch function? What are the haptic competencies in infants, children and adults? To what extent could touch compensate for visual deprivation? How do and touch cooperate in sighted people? In this talk, I will examine a selection of interesting findings concerning the haptic perceptual processing and then the relation between vision and touch in cross-modal coordination. Finally, I will focus on two practical domains where the intervention of haptic perception improves the efficiency of performances, education and blindness. In the second section, concern how does touch function. In this section, I will now examine what we know about the general laws of haptics. The problem is to know whether these laws are the same as those evidence in the visual modality, as been argued by Gibson, or does some specificity of haptics lead in some cases to original modes of processing information. To answer this question, we must first explain the major difference between the visual and haptic ways of gathering information, namely exploratory movement. Manual exploratory movement have been extensively studied by colleagues Susan Lederman and Roberta Klasky. The main property of exploratory movement is that they are intentional, and they are specialized according to what is to be perceived. For example, lateral motion for texture perception, pressure for hardness, static contact for temperature, unsportic holding for weight, enclosure for global shape and volume, contour following for global shape and exact shape. This means that, that if optimal exploratory procedure is not produced, the corresponding property will not or poorly be perceived. In addition, in some cases, these exploratory movements are performed successively because they are not compatible from a motor point of view. This constraint increases the sequential and time-consuming nature of haptic perception. As a result, mem working memory may be overloaded. In blindfolded adults, adapt exploratory procedures are very generally observed, but, the, but their development change over time. In infants, small finger movements and pressure variation during grasping allow effective texture and shape discrimination. 
In blindfolded children, manual activity remains spontaneous and restrained because it, it cannot be guided by vision. Exploratory procedures are partial and stereotyped. For example, at five years of age, lateral motion procedure adapted for perceiving texture dominates, whereas the contour following procedure adapted to size and shape perception is less frequent. As a result, free categorization tasks of multidimensional objects are generally based on texture at this age, five years, while they are based on size or shape in older children, nine, for example, nine, and adults. In congenitally blind young children, the manual exploratory activities are not relevant. Often, children don't use the relevant experimental procedure to perceive the targeted property. While their hands should be very active to compensate for visual deprivation, they tend to be passive. They don't spontaneously initiate haptic search and exploration of objects. Early and intensive educative guidance is necessary to teach uh, congenital blind young children how to use their hands to explore their near space. Of course, it should be noted that sighted children do not need such learning to perceive their visual environment. Second main characteristic of haptic manual perception concerns the size of the perceptual field. That is to say, the portion of space with which can be perceived without movement. This field is much smaller than the visual field, of course, but it may be intentionally extended or reduced by the participant according to the way the hands are used to explore. Therefore, only in haptics, observers actively generate the sensory inflow from which they create their perceptions. This haptic field is maximally extended when the two hands and all fingers are simultaneously in contact with the stimuli, and haptic field is maximally reduced when exploration is performed with only the finger type of the one index finger. Such an ability to change the size of the perceptual field has no equivalent in visual perception and has specific consequences on haptic processing. When this field is maximally reduced, large portions of the context in which the stimuli is presented are not perceived. As a result, the field effects, which are interaction between part of the figure and between the figure and its context, will be prevented or weakened. For example, the perceptual illusions observed in vision are not always present in haptics, although some of them are at work in both modalities. For example, when the index finger can isolate and exclude from its perceptual field the disturbing contextual information, no famous Delboeuf illusion um, haptic is observed. By contrast, famous muller layer illusion, the angles of arrows are too acute to allow their exclusion from the haptic field, and whatever the exploratory procedure use, use error or overestimation or underestimation of the correct line, A in the seg typical segment, observe in haptics as well in vision. Second example, the well-known, uh, third example, the well-known perceptual laws of gestalt of proximity and similarity which at work in vision since infancy has been observed in haptics in blindfolded children of age nine, but not in those of age five to six. Globally, the perceptual organization of the stimuli is not in a structured totality much harder to achieve in haptics than in vision. It's already suggested by famous Reves. 
third point concerns free versus rustic manual exploration. In some recent studies, exploration is constrained and limited to the use of single index finger, which leads to unique control following exploratory procedure. It is a case, for example, in the virtual reality studies using phantom device, for example. But Lederman and Klasky uh, show that the free exploration is more efficient than different kinds of restricted exploration. Exploration by only one finger index prevents the use of beneficial enclosure exploratory procedure. It, re it reduces cutaneous cues and enhances kinesthetic cues. It increases the sequential nature of haptic processing and overloads working memory. Consequently, it has a poor ecological validity. This means we should be cautious, very cautious, when we generalize the results obtained in the experimental studies based on restricted exploration to everyday activities, haptic activities. Last point concerns differences in visual and haptic functioning. First point concerns movement coding a D2 effect. The exploratory movement itself is coded in haptic distance or location estimation instead of poor spatial coding. For distance estimation and D2 effect, there are several experiments. In our experiment, participants follow straight and curvilinear paths in an encoding phase. And then, with a straight movement, participant must estimate the Euclidean distance between the start point and end point of the path in response phase. The Euclidean distance between these two points is overestimate if n follow a D2 path instead of crossing a direct line movement between these points. We show that this Euclidean distance estimation is problematic and D2 effect occurs in both congenitally blind children and adults and also in blindfolded sighted adults. Regarding the location spatial location estimation and also the D2 effect, Klasky Roberta Klasky proposed a path completion task by asking blindfolded adults to haptically explore two legs of a triangle path and then mark the shortest route back to the origin. This is, in fact, the third leg of the triangle. We propose a similar paradigm in blindfolded and blind adults. Four paths were proposed in the exploration phase, and in the response phase, participants also mark the shortest route back to the eulogian. A result shows that the, the haptic responses, that is the estimated vector from the end to the start point, in both blindfolded and blind adults, systematically varied according to the four geometrical path. This suggests also that people use a mode of coning based on exploratory movement to infer spatial location in space. Third point regarding differences in visual and haptic functioning concerns gravitational cues and oblique effect. Gravitational cues are processed by haptic system and intervene in the haptic estimation of spatial orientation. These cues are provided by proprioceptive receptors located in joint and muscle. Whereas the fingers are poorly constrained by gravity, the arms must develop anti-gravitational anti forces to move in the air when they explore a rigid rod stimulus in order to evaluate its orientation. And these gravity cues are processed by the haptic system. The famous haptic oblique effect, that is the vertical and horizontal spatial orientation, are better perceived than other oblique orientation. Uh, 
is observed when these gravitational cues are present, and this haptic oblique effect is absent when these cues are reduced, for example, when spatial plane in which the stimulus is present is, is changed. When the plane is orientally, oriented vertically, frontal or frontal, parallel, frontal parallel plane, so encoding movement requires a higher level of muscle activation to oppose gravity than movement in horizontal plane. Third point uh, concerns force cues. Recent studies using a virtual display have examined the nature and direction of force cues involved in pers haptic perception of spatial property. Force cues can be in competition with geometric cues. For example, the introduction of orthogonal forces during finger exploration on surface create an illusion of curvature. Second example, we show that according to the nature of force cues introduced during exploratory movement, friction opposition or traction disruption, underestimation or overestimation of a virtual segment length were observed. Now, first intermediate conclusion. Of course, this list of works is not exhaustive, and numerous other studies could be quoted. Their important conclusion is that in addition to all the general laws of perception applying in abstic, as in all perceptual systems, some specific mode of functioning are at work in this modality because of the characteristic of these exploratory activities. One consequence of the difference between haptic and visual functioning is that the perceptual efficiency of these two modalities is quite different. Vision, vision is the highest competent system for gathering and processing spatial information whereas haptics provides poor spatial data because of its reduced perceptual field and its sequential nature. By contrast, the haptic system is very well adapted to discriminate what Lederman and Klasky call the property of objects, such as texture or rigidity, elasticity, and in this domain, it surprises vision. There is a functional specialization of modalities. Vision is specialized in spatial domain and haptics is specialized in the perception of the material qualities of objects, as previously suggested by Pick in 1972. In third section concerns intermodal visual haptic coordination. In everyday life, all perceptual modalities are at work simultaneously or in rapid succession. And all data received by all of them must be coordinated in order to form an unitary, a coherent representation of environment. Neurophysiological studies have demonstrated that this cross-modal integration has neural roots. Until 1960s, an all a empiricist conception of the relations between modalities at birth dominated in psychology. According to the point of view in neonates, in young, very young, young infants, no communication was possible between this perceptual system. For example, he considered that baby did not know that the bottle they saw and the bottle they touched were the same and unique object. Only the intensive experiences and bim of bimodal perception occurring in infancy and childhood, seeing and touching simultaneously the same object, will allow an association between this specific and haptic perception, and also intermodal coordination observed in adults. This conception of total independence modalities at birth and during the first years of life has been completely invalidated by the recent studies. Young infants 
a even neonates from one, two days, were tested with a classic habituation and reaction to novelty experimental paradigm. The occurrence of intermodal transfer from touch, touch to vision was shown in infants, first age, first 12 months, six months, two months, and recently in two or three days. By contrast, reverse transfer from vision to touch seems more difficult. It was evident from only from five months of age. In this experiment, we studied cross-modal recognition of shape from hand to eyes in human newborns. We tested two groups. In experimental group of newborn, two phases were proposed. First phase was a familiarization tactile phase and then a visual taste phase. And a baseline control group was only a group with neonate with only the visual taste phase. Two predictions are possible. Regarding to the experimental group, regarding to tactual to visual modality experimental group. Um, if the newborn were able to transfer shape information, uh, small objects, prism or cylinder, from the manual to the visual modality, they would look longer at the subject which had not previously been presented in the tactual habituation phase, novel object, that and the familiar object. By contrast, regarding the control group, only visual modality baseline control group, no difference was expected in looking times between two visual objects. In, regarding the, the method, two groups were tested. In the tactual to visual modality experimental group, there is a tactual habituation phase. We use a specific habituation criterion. Trials continue until there was a 30% decline in the manual all the time on two consecutive trials relative to all the time of the first two trials. It's very specific. And in the visual control group, no tactual habituation phase were proposed. In experiment one, familiar and novel objects in the experimental visual test phase were alternatively presented during four trials. In experiment two, familiar and novel objects were simultaneously presented for 60 seconds. Results show that newborn in experimental group look at the novel object for longer duration than the familiar object. In contrast, newborn in the baseline group look equally at both objects. Moreover, in the experimental group, infants made more gaze shift towards the novel object than the familiar object. Six, uh, this, is, this recognition in the experimental group stems from the haptic habituation phase only. Taking together the two experiments seems to reveal the ability to newborn to transfer shape information from hand to eyes before they had the opportunity to learn from the pairing of visual and tactile experience. Nevertheless, intermodal coordination seems as innate roots, contrary to empiricist point of view, although it needs, of course, multimodal experience to develop. In other children and adults, intermodal visual haptic and haptic visual transfer have been compared to unimodal haptic haptic and visual visual transfer. If similar performances were observed in the intermodal and unimodal condition, it would suggest that no information is lost during the transfer from one modality to the other modality, perhaps because both lead to a modal representation of object, as suggested by Gibson. In special tasks, superior scores are obtained in the unimodal visual-visual condition, 
compared to the haptic unimodal haptic haptic condition. This confirms higher efficiency of vision in spatial perception. Regarding the comparison between the unimodal haptic haptic and two intermodal condition, haptic vision and vision haptic, results are not consistent. More consistent results are obtained in comparison between two intermodal conditions. They often show that transfer is easier from haptics to vision than in the reverse direction from vision to haptics. This asymmetry, observed at, at all edges, is not compatible with the hypothesis of amodal processing. In conclusion, it seems that something is sometimes lost when information is transferred across perceptual modalities, although this loss may be minimal. Another way to evaluate cross-modal relations is to study how modality functions simultaneously. For spatial tasks in adults, adding haptic data to vision doesn't really modify the accuracy of response, whereas adding vision to haptics significantly improves performances. For discrimination of texture, not shape, only texture, the bimodal vision plus haptics presentation of stimulus improves discrimination. This observation confirms the specialization of vision in spatial perception and the specialization of haptics in perception of the material qualities of objects. This specialization, perceptual specialization, is shown in the situation, famous situation of perceptual conflict, where visual data are experimentally decorated from the haptic data, as proposed by Rock and Victor in 1964. In this condition, participants touch a cube and see a rectangular parallelepiped in the same spatial location in this picture. In spatial tasks, when the response is visual, a tendency to visual capture is observed. Visual capture means that the discordant haptic data has been discarded. It has not been taken into account. In spatial tasks, when the test is haptic, a tendency to compromise is observed, a kind of average between the conflicting data. data. By contrast, when the visual haptic perceptual conflict concerns texture discrimination, a compromise between two visual and haptic values is obtained, or even a tendency to haptic capture. This means that the most efficient modality regarding property to be perceived plays a pilot role in the processing of discordant information. A puzzling question raised by specific behavior observed in visually impaired people having some residual vision. When the visual impaired is severe and when the visual pathology may lead later to complete blindness, this person learns to read and write blind. Even blind is difficult to, of course, to discriminate visually. But visually impaired children or, ch or adults often refuse to be blindfolded when they learn blind. And most of them actually read brain with their deficient eyes instead of using their efficient fingers. The brain reading by visual impaired people is a case where the less accurate modality vision, accurate modality vision is added for some type completely substitute to the higher accurate modality touch. This Inversion is not compatible with, with academic study described previously on the relation between vision and haptics. In this spatial task, may, vision may help touch mainly in providing an external contextual reference frame. We know that Mila, Susanna Mila, shows that how important are these reference frame or cues in spatial processing, but it's only an hypothesis. Finally, I will now present some of studies showing how the use of haptic perceptual system may enhance learning and performances in some domains. Uh, 
The first application is education dedicated to typically young children. Most typically pre schools program involve using the visual and auditory modality of young children. We show that the addition of haptic exploration in ordinary conventional training helps to prepare kindergarten children for reading, and writing and mathematics and improves their efficiency. For example, just very fast example, haptic exploration has been added to vision and audition in training session de designed to increase in five years old children the understanding of the alphabetic principle. This training develops phonemic awareness, knowledge of later and also letter sound correspondences. Manify raised later were explored by children either visually and haptically in multisensory conduction or in control group explore only visually in control condition. Results show that in post-test of pseudo-word decoding, better performances after multisensory training than control training. In conclusion, incorporating the haptic exploration of letter leads to a more analytical processing of the letter and also letter sound correspondences than where the letter is presented only visually. I have a very short reportage of French TV about this. Uh, in the first one, oh, yes. Autre main, on va suivre. Sorry, it is in French, but. On monte. Hop. Teacher, explain. It is an ordinary classroom. Cette exploration, cette appréhension de la lettre. Well, it's me, sorry. <laughs> and uh, in the first phase, there are uh, seven, eight children with the teacher. And the children must follow each letter, target letter. In the second phase, children were blindfolded and must haptically explore Later, is not very uh, understandable, and try to discriminate the target letter proposed or trained in the tr training session. D'ores et déjà, en France, une centaine d'écoles maternelles ont décidé de mettre en pratique cette nouvelle méthode d'apprentissage. And there are a lot of sessions during the year. Yes, one, cinq minutes. Okay. Second well-known application is, of course, blindness. This domain, you know, is very vast and impossible to det detail here. Acuity, oral languages, mental imagery, gender differences and touch, mobility, braille, sensory substitution device, picture perception. I would like now to present a recent study about tactile illustration recognition by blind people. In tactile illustrated books, illustrations are scanned with the fingertips and the reader has to interpret and associate meaning with the pictures. As is the case with sighted children, tactile illustration could be helpful for visual impaired children's cognitive languages and literacy development and also should help them the understanding and remember the story. For, however, the first step, the haptic identification of tactile pictures is not simple, as you know, for people who are blind it vary according to first point, characteristic of the picture and the participant. Yes, yes, I understand. Yes, 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 yes. Sorry, sorry, sorry. 
This ability varies according to characteristic of the picture and participant, haptic exploration ability, and also task demands. Tact illustration in tactile books come in a wide variety of material. It can be produced by several technique, different techniques, such as swell paper, thermoform, texture, and 3D objects. Tactile pictures, as literally transfer from visual picture, may, be, may not fit with the cognitive and haptic abilities of young blind children, and bidimensional representation can be very hard to understand. Each illustration technique doesn't provide the same kind of information about the real object. Thompson shows better recognition by blindfolded sighted adults of texture pictures than raised line drawings. Also, Picard and Lebaz in adults show that swell paper appear to be better for identification of tactile drawings than plastic films. Moreover, the illustration technique may influence the haptic exploratory processing of objects depicted. Raise line appears to be the less promising technique since the participant have to perform a contour following exploratory procedure, which puts strong constraint on working memory. The ability to identify raise line picture without training has been characterized by low identification rate and long response time. Conversely, several arguments support the texture pictures technique as a better medium for enhancing the identification process. Recently, we compare three techniques for illustration among children with our early blind. 24 stimuli corresponding to eight tactile pictures illustrated using three different techniques, texture, thermoforming, and raised line, were presented to participants. They were told to freely explore a set, it's totally free, a set of tactile drawings of objects using both ends and to identify each driving as quickly and accurately as possible. Before participants start the identification task, the name of the four object category were given. We selected two uh, natural objects, banana wraps, two handle artifacts, kitchen utensils, saucepan bowl, and two non-handle artifacts, motorbike helicopter. we show that recognition of texture pictures was better than uh, of thermoform and raised line pictures. Texture offered salient cues. It provides twofold sources of information, both shape and material objects ma had made of. Another illustration technique is the use of 3D objects. Indeed, we know that haptic manual system is highly efficient, fast recognition, and almost error-free. When blindfolded sighted adults and children use it to use 3D common real life small objects. We compare um, the exploratory procedure and the recognition between child and the rider in a joint book reading activity when using either 2D or 3D illustration. The results show that the 3D illustration lead to use a wider variety of exploratory procedures than the 2D illustration. This suggests that children were able to collect more information with a former kind of illustration te technique. We know also that Tactile, tactile picture recognition depends on the level of knowledge regarding visual convention for drawing objects, which explains why expertise with tactile picture helps recognition. We already show that children who regularly use tactile pictures perform better than participants with no or infrequent use. The 3D illustration, for example, miniaturized object, pop-up setting, seems to be 
interesting way of investigation, of both for researcher and practitioner. As Daniel Valent presented yesterday in the parallel session, we are now studying a new idea of haptic books for blind children. In this book, this illustration is based at sensory motor and haptic experiences. The aim is to explore a new approach of tactile discovery. So action simulation by finger movement, small finger movement. Indeed, using two fingers, shy mimics the movement of the leg and performs various action. Jump a trampoline, playing a swing. Other goal of the current research is in the lab is application of method of participatory design to involve blind children in the design of the books. I will show you a video of one of these projects in partnership with a colleague, Brimbing Finger. This video is about, a very short video, is about very creative activity, use song and 3D illustration by famous French illustrator Hervé Tulay with blind children. It's okay. Oui. Alors, euh... mais mais ah, mais il y a des surprises partout. Il y en a partout. Non, le... enfin, ça, mais attention, attention. J'ai un truc que je voudrais vous faire. Ça, par exemple. Ah, tout tout ça. Ça, ça, attends, il y a quelque chose. Tu as This reportage is available on YouTube. Then the activity book Hervé et moi was designed to compile some of the best activity and recreate this very creative atmosphere. I invite you to discover this book with Daniel and Philippe in the standard Dreaming Finger. Currently, we began a new participatory project to create a multi-sensory book about National Sciences and Museum of Toulouse in France. And finally, in conclusion, during Chilol, illustrated books are a great driver for social inclusion as they foster joint reading between child and adult or between child and his parents. These haptic books are also an advantage in terms of the design for all approach because they are based on sensory experiences that are possibly the same for children who are sight and blind, which could create communication between, between these two communities. I finished. Thank you for attention. Thank you very much for your very interesting lecture. And Thank I you. think it was nice to have this historical overview of the research in touch as well and contemporary. Uh, I think there is time for a few questions. No questions? I do have a question. Yes. And uh, you will. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. You have water? No, no. There is no. 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 No, no problem. Okay. No problem. Uh, was it a question? No. Okay. I have a question. Uh, you talked about haptic recognition, and if they recognize a shape, or I, I, I understood it as an object. They were faster, they were quicker if the object were familiar with them, for them. And I, I wonder, how do, you, how do you define recognition? And how, do you, how can you control that they recognize the object? Um, in this, for example, yeah. in not experiment uh, with Torre, recognize um, means uh, correct identification. But how can you see, how can you tell that, the, that it is a, a correct identification? Uh, for example, um, blind say banana. Touch yeah, okay, ban the banana. But if they don't know the word, uh, or if they're going ah, to explain, so it's. it's okay, they, they are before we check 
yeah. uh, level of vocabulary in each blind people. All um, concepts are, um, uh, are known by um, blind tested. Yeah, okay. So it, it was also real objects. It yes. was not. Yeah, ap that's what I was thinking. And then I was thinking of another, uh, of another thing. It's, you have these pop-up books. Mm -hmm. New project. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I find it very interesting, but I also thinking because I have learned from reading other people's experiment that it's if you have a 3D model, mm -hmm. it is, or if you have a higher relief, it could be harder to to interpret it because you have an extra part, so to to say, to to that identify if you have. That is why it's better for blind children. In our case. Yes. In your case, okay, to have this pop up. But mm -hmm. how long the this if you have a three D object and if the distance is too far between the, the arms, how will they get an over ah, yeah, all very interesting question. Yeah. For a moment we tested uh, only small object yeah. in the very near spatial mm. field, but uh, I don't know. No. Probably it's not very good, it is very large. No. So it's maybe it works well because they are yes. small parts, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, one question. It's on? Is it on? I think you have to wait 15 seconds or something. No. <laughs> Is no. it working? Yeah, okay. Yes. Thank you for a nice talk, Charlotte Magnusson, Lund University. Uh, I was curious, at one thing you were saying that the transfer between visual and haptic and the transfer from, from haptics and visual, and uh, you were so, sort of saying things about that. You have to speak up, it's... yeah. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the transfer between uh, haptic, you were talking about transfer from haptics to vision and from vision to haptics. Yes. And uh, I was just, because you didn't give any details of how that was measured, and I'm thinking that very often haptics will be slower yes. by sort of the way it works. Mm. Uh, so. Uh, was that just because haptics is slower, or was it actually worse in some other way? Um, both. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, there are large studies about this topic between reversed um, uh, phenomenon. It's very uh, strange, in fact. And um, researcher control uh, duration of haptic phase, duration of visual phase. Uh, in one case, same time we propose, and that is why it is difference between haptics and visual. But in some other study, he propose a different time, very long time for haptic phase, and then visual phase uh, very short, and the same phenomenon is observed. Don't, uh, this factor influence the um, ratio, quality of performance of transfer, but don't explain totally the phenomenon. Mm. Uh, one more question. Then I ah, think yeah, monsieur. Oh. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Au fond, le voyage. Yeah. It's one, and then one more, then we have to stop. <laughs> Café is possible for Eric with me. <laughs> Okay. Yes. Ah, oh well. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you. Um, I have uh, a question um, because always uh, in uh, brain uh, we speak about uh, visual area in uh, occipital. Uh, well, please yes. keep the. You have to have the well, microphone very the close to your mouth and speak uh, up. Okay. <laughs> it's good. Nine. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes. My my question is uh, about. Um, uh, visual area in brain. Always uh, we uh, we speak about visual area in this uh, occipital uh, yes. area. Yes, yeah. and um, uh, always we said that uh, uh, when blind people is active in its uh, uh, exploration, uh, this area is active too. It's not me, huh? it's Pascual Leon uh, from Harvard, it's not me. Yes, uh, but it's uh, published. Very, very often uh, we. Uh, yes, yes, yes. 
we have uh, this uh, demonstration. And uh, my question is uh, why we speak always about visual and not about a speciality area. Because uh, this area is also active when we hear. We hear ah. so something somewhere in okay. space. Just and also when body is uh, going uh, yes, 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 in any yes. direction <laughs> and so on. And uh, why we, we don't speak about speciality area? Uh, why uh, is the uh, why? Because um, in these studies, um, search, uh, researcher must do be focused on uh, also two specialities. But uh, they are same phenomenon with with uh, auditory modalities also. All the studies show the same phenomenon. But um, uh, in neurophysiological approach. Uh, there are um, great speciality, uh, sp specialized uh, great specialization for each sensorial modality. But currently, this specialization decreases. And now, for example, some research show even in the very occipital uh, low level first area, visual area, it is possible uh, to be influenced by proprioceptive cues. So currently, uh, the um, approach considers that, um, for example, visu call uh, visual area are not so visual, but multisensorial uh, um, areas, for example. But it's a recent research. Tra traditionally, in a book, academic book, their um, uh, specialization, it's an uh, only academic point of view for students. Uh, I'm sorry, but I think we have ah. to stop here because